we'll go into a lot of detail in the motor control chapter about uh, the structure of the basal ganglia and cerebellum. But in this case, we'll, we'll start by just showing, going through how the basal ganglia works in a quick overview so you can get an idea of how these different kind of neural circuits uh, may, may be specialized relative to what's going on in the cortex. Here we see the posterior cortex, the frontal cortex, um, and then connections into the striatum, which is the input nucleus of the basal ganglia, going down into the globus pallidus and the substantia nigra pars reticulata, it's a mouthful. And then here is again this thalamus, which the, is the output of the basal ganglia, the critical kind of output pathway, which is then bidirectionally interconnected with the frontal cortex. And so these specific regions of the thalamus are the ones that directly interconnect with the frontal cortex. And the basal ganglia is essentially modulating these multiple loops of inhibition, multiple chains of inhibition into the thalamus. And so when the system is in its kind of default state, uh, the substantia nigra pars reticulata is active and it's therefore inhibiting neurons in the thalamus. These red da dashed uh, connections indicate GABA inhibition. But when these direct pathway neurons, which we call the GO pathway in the basal ganglia, fire, they serve to inhibit the otherwise kind of tonic or, you know, overall baseline level of activity of the SNR, and that disinhibits the thalamus, opening up this active loop, and, and that opening up of this activity loop in between the frontal cortex and thalamus is then what initiates motor control actions, behavioral actions, overt actions, and also cognitive actions like, you know, hmm, I'm actually going to go do something. You know, when you make that decision to really go do something, um, that's, that's when your uh, this kind of loop opens up and you finally made that decision. And so this is how the basal ganglia can play a kind of modulatory or gating-like role in, in controlling uh, what happens in other areas, in particular in frontal cortex. The other thing that's very important about these circuits is that they're directly modulated by dopamine, as we mentioned, and so dopamine um, really influences the learning of uh, neurons in the striatum. This diagram shows you, as we pick up from those uh, parietal and uh, ventral uh, streams in the cortical hierarchy in posterior cortex, now uh, feeding into the higher levels of the medial temporal lobe, in particular the parahippocampal cor cortex and the perirhinal cortex, feeding into the entorhinal cortex. Rhinal here means smell or olfaction, nose like rhinoceros, um, and that is indicating that these are also nearby to uh, olfactory cortex. Again, they're not actually olfactory cortex; they just kind of, or they just have these anatomical names, um, and this is kind of further abstraction and hierarchy of uh, producing a very high level uh, executive summary of information here in entorhinal cortex, which is then encoded by these layers of the hippocampus, taking essentially a snapshot of what was going on in the entorhinal cortex and then feeding that back out. Critically, the hippocampus is not only able to kind of encode essentially like a hash code of what was going on in the brain, so essentially a, a pattern separated, very uh, orthogonalized, uh, uh, unique representation of all of the different pieces of information that are currently active in your brain as summarized in entorhinal cortex, takes that snapshot and then memorizes it, but is also able to reconstruct your whole memory based on a retrieval cue by filling in through this uh, reverse pathway from this kind of area CA1 back out to the internal cortex. And so these are these arrows in red are the top-down pathways that allow retrieval of memories um, when you need to get back to that information later. So again, we'll talk about this in the memory chapter and see how these uh, unique features of the hippocampus are capable of enabling uh, rapid learning of new information in the hippocampus. We will also look at language as we go through in chapter 9, uh, and this is really a great example of how all the different parts of the brain and the cortex and even the basal ganglia and hippocampus, all these different brain areas, interact together to support this diff diverse uh, kinds of functions that we see in language. Um, so in one way, language is kind of special. It's, it has certain kind of features that are not present in other kinds of cognitive domains, 
so to speak, but it also is general purpose in the sense that it is using and taking advantage of cognitive, you know, functionality, the, the different brain circuits that are used for lots of different things in, in non-language kinds of uh, cognitive processing. So it, it makes a really nice kind of integrative uh, picture to understand how language works in the context of all these different brain mechanisms that we will have covered up to that point. So this is just a simple diagram here of how we think uh, that uh, semantic knowledge is really distributed throughout different brain areas. There isn't one kind of dictionary in your brain for what a word means. Instead, it's all these same kind of distributed representations. So your knowledge, for example, of a telephone is something about how you use it, how it feels, what it, you know, how, how you actually push the buttons, etc. Um, and uh, you know, clouds are mostly kind of visual thunders auditory so the, these different types of concepts have different weightings on how much they depend on different sensory and motor and auditory kind of areas etc so this gives you a nice kind of sense of the distributed loading of language across all different areas of the brain and then you do have some specialization here for representing kind of words the specialized word recognition areas in the visual stream and uh, a lot of processing associated with how you hear speech and process speech and, and are able to articulate and generate speech, all having to do with this concept of phonology. We kind of carry forward those ideas about uh, the what versus where slash how kind of ideas about the posterior cortical organization and carry those forward up into the frontal cortex uh, where the dorsal uh, lateral aspects of the frontal cortex are essentially interacting with these parietal areas, uh, integrating and controlling sensory information to guide behavior, um, motor actions, whereas the ventral areas are interacting more with infratemporal lobe, kind of in this more what pathway kind of thing, and that's really important for providing top-down control and planning and everything with respect to semantic knowledge, uh, your knowledge of uh, objects and events and things like that that's encoded in the temporal lobes. So you can still see a, a bit of a division there that holds up between the uh, uh, kind of dorsal versus ventral pathways and frontal cortex. And if you slice through that, that uh, kind of brain tissue um, and look at it uh, in the kind of coronal slice, uh, where now this is uh, the kind of outside part, the lateral portion of the uh, brain, then in the medial, as, as is generally true in the brain, the medial is associated with the affective, limbic, uh, hot, emotional kind of areas or aspects of executive function, um, whereas the lateral areas are more about the kind of cold sensory motor uh, kind of uh, uh, processing. So how do you actually solve particular tasks? How do you ride a bike or something? You know, those kinds of ideas are, those kinds of uh, knowledge is represented in the lateral areas, whereas the kind of, you know, do you want to ride a bike? I mean, is it fun to ride a bike? That's kind of uh, in, in these more medial motivational areas. And you can actually trace uh, in detail uh, these medial areas in terms of how they interconnect with subcortical areas and these kind of affective signals these motivational signals are really grounded in our brain stems uh, where we have these more fundamental evolutionarily adaptive kind of coding of basic emotional responses and so you can see if, if you as you go here this is kind of the medial wall uh, going from the ventral up here to the dorsal and this medial wall is described as the anterior cingulate cortex looping around here around the corpus callosum and uh, so the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex area 25 has been widely identified with uh, depression, negative affect, it's kind of colored red here. Um, these areas kind of folding out, going more medially, and then uh, coursing out into the um, uh, lateral surface down as we go here. This is kind of unfolding that brain tissue. Um, those areas are more positively associated with positive valence it seems, and they're interconnected with these brainstem areas that encode positive valence. 
Um, and then if you go more up into these anterior cingulate areas above the subgenual area, this genu is like the knee, um, then you get into uh, perhaps encoding of things more closely tied to the action representations in the lateral surface and the outer surface of the cortex um, that are representing the plans and the ideas that you're formulating for what you want to do. And the anterior cingulate is kind of evaluating those and sort of saying, well, is this overall going to be a good idea or a bad idea? And if it decides it's going to be a good idea, uh, if it, it's going to have a positive balance of, of benefits versus costs, then maybe the, it also kind of activates that more. So there's a lot of really interesting uh, uh, ways of understanding how these different circuits in the frontal cortex interact with our brainstem systems to support this executive motivated uh, functional cognition. Okay, so that's our big whirlwind tour of the brain. Uh, next, we'll start talking about perception.